of knowing. All right, man. Welcome to Crow Triple Seven Radio. This is episode 291. Jason Lindgren is with me, and we've asked back Howdy McCuskey. And uh, we're going to be covering, among other things, we're going to start with a book called The Mutus Liber. For those who understand Latin, it basically comes down to meaning a silent book. What it actually is, is pretty much a book without words, relying on the art of symbology. Tarot cards, like so many are looking at the Marseille deck right now and reading meditations on the tarot uh, because it pairs off the Christian mystic ideas. There's a lot of crossover here. How much, I don't know. Uh, Unfortunately, I've never been taught by a master. What I know, I've picked up from old texts. But just to lay the groundwork, uh, in many of these images, there will be like the idea of a cross. It's not literally in the images. This is the same of the tarot, too. So if you had a right-left division, that would separate like the below or the earth ideas from the divine or the heaven ideas. And then there's a vertical one that bridges the two or, or something like that. But there's so much to this. It's basically speaking to your subconscious or supposed to be speaking to your subconscious. And I guess we'll get into it. Welcome, Jason. And good morning. So this is not going to be an easy one to do. Uh, Not a lot of words associated with it, but we'll see what we can do here. Um, We're ahead a little bit, aren't we? Yes, we are. A couple weeks at this point. That's a good thing because I've got to get a new computer system installed here. Anyhow, let's do this. Uh, Welcome, Howdy. Hey, guys. Thanks again for having me back. I really appreciate talking to you again. Cool, man. How's it where you are? It's been quite cold, and so it's been a lot of um, go out, do what you need to do, um, get a quick walk in, stay active, and then just drink tea and eat warm food. (laughs) Well, you kind of put the Great White North to shame because you're in Scandinavia, right? (laughs) Yeah, you know, for a guy who's not a big fan of winter, you know, after (laughs) I, I live in Canada for a whole part of my life, and then I moved to Scandinavia, so... What was I thinking? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're always welcome to come to Louisiana. Hey, uh, if if there if uh, Mardi Gras ever happens again, so we can come down and do that and and uh, be at some jazz clubs, happy to join you. <laughs> yeah, there's a question. Are they are they doing Mardi Gras in February? No, not the parades or anything like that. Nope. Oh, brother. All right. Well, there's all that. Well, where I am here in Rhode Island, I should be absolutely frozen stiff, and I'm wearing shorts and flip flops. It's 47 degrees. I went to the I went into town yesterday and I was walking around in shorts. Everyone's staring at me. I'm like, yeah, whatever, global, global warming rocks. Mm. Um, but anyhow, um, how do you want to jump in? You want to start by by just burning through the appendix or something, Jason, to get us into the key plate? Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to be reading from Howdy's book. Falling for Truth, uh, Spiritual Death and Awakening. So Appendix F, The Mutus Liber, or Silent Book, was mentioned in Chapter 8, but here I will go into detail on this very unique presentation. Only with a background in hermetics and alchemic symbolism can what is here be unraveled. There are many layers, and all I can provide is what I can decipher from them. There is far more to be found than just what I can see. Go through it yourself. What comes to you? First published in 1677 in New Rochelle, France, this work contains almost no words at all. Instead, Within it, one finds 15 images. In this way, it is similar to the major arcana of the tarot. The first plate of the silent book shows a sleeping man with a ladder beside him, while the last plate depicts the man risen and the ladder cast aside. I believe the book to be the symbolic rendering of climbing Jacob's ladder. I will re-give that explanation here. Note that the plates are not just reference material meant to be glanced at. They are infused with power and are meant to be studied and meditated upon, almost as if they were paintings hanging on the walls of a gallery. I I guess I'll take it a step further. Uh, From my point of view and what I've learned over the years from studying these things, it's about symbology, and for lack of a better way to describe it, uh, it speaks to your subconscious. One of the ideas in, say, spagyrics is, uh, I've got my little chemistry set in front of me. I'm going to do a spagyric process, which is the alchemy of plants. And when I do that transmutation, the idea is, I think, that the subconscious recognizes the process. In other words, what I am doing to this dandelion, I can do to myself as I'm burning away the impurities, as I'm exalting it, as I'm separating it down to body, soul, spirit, and recombining. I think that's one of the overarching truths held in alchemy, but there's 
so much more than I can possibly get at. I mean, what do you, what do you want to jump in on here, Howdy? Well, I guess um, for me, uh, the reason I chose the to add these plates when I came up to them when I was writing my book was because it. I was writing a chapter, uh, uh, the chapter eight there, which was on uh, Richard Rose's uh, of the Tat Foundation's what he called method to go from awake to asleep, which we, which he called Jacob's ladder. And that method, when I when I've been writing it, and I came across the mutus liber, bizarrely was like being presented symbolically in the plates, and so it really interested me because I I, I thought was he tapping into something much much more ancient because these these we don't know of course for sure where this originated or what the real background is but it's claimed to be coming from New Rochelle France which is important because that was the place where the Templar fleet was supposed to have been docked so it's like it's giving you this um, pointer to saying are these plates somehow linked to the knowledge of the of the Knights Templar and maybe even to the to the Cathars and that that sort of took me my interest in these 15 images to another level to really want to, yeah, like you say, break through some of the symbolism and the hermeticism in them to see what could be understood from the plate itself. What are the differences with the color plates and the black and white plates? The images are definitely the same notion, but definitely different artwork. Um, I got the sense that the, the originals are in black and white and that uh, those are the first ones and that colored ones appeared over time, like anything, they, they, by coloring them and changing them a little, you can market them and sell them. And I, I think that's probably how they originated. So let, let, let's address that real quick. Let me start from the beginning. The new Rochelle thing, all about it. When I'm looking at hermetic ideas, in my mind, if I want to get back to what I consider to be authentic, I am happy to be in France. The further back I can go in France, the happier I am. Uh, problem is, is a lot of the stuff was written in German and French and um, Latin. So we're at the mercy of people who have translated. But I'm all about what Howdy's saying. The fact that this is claimed New Rochelle back in the 1700s, um, that's, that's a big plus. Now, the color, I can speak to that. These were almost certain. I mean, they certainly were originally created in black and white. So when you're looking at color later... Why did someone color it? Because it's pretty, because they think a leaf should be green. You see where I'm going here, and I'll, I'll translate that over to the Marseille tarot deck, which so many people have taken an interest in, in, because that too comes from France way back, maybe as close to an original tarot as we can get, but people have redone it. As a matter of fact, one of the books out there covering the Marseille deck is by, it's called CBD or something like this. So this dude tracks back to Marseille to find that that's the original tarot deck using the same ideas here, symbology speaking to the subconscious, and he redesigns the deck. And so here's my problem. If everything here is symbolically speaking to your subconscious, then color is two, as is known from the tarot decks, which is a, a crossover between how many colors they could print and what the masters thought were important. So if you're not Master Lord Bufu, who the hell are you to be redesigning and changing colors and things like that? So that's my big beef with all this. And to be clear of what I just said, I fell for the CBD deck too when I started studying. And I have it, and it's good reference, but I want the Marseille. I want to go old. I want to go unsullied. I want it back to as original as I can get, because who knows whether the people that change it are masters or not. What would you add to that, Howdy? Yeah, I, and I mean, we're going to, as we go through, probably talk a bit about the the alchemic stages. And generally in alchemy, you'll, you'll find either a sort of a, a series of either three, four, or seven steps as it's laid out usually. If you go with the three or four, which is the most common, that would be um, the first step of Negretto, which is sort of like a blackening, and you'll find the color black there and, and sort of a descent into the into the mind or the subconscious. You have an albedo, which is a whitening, which would be more classified like as an awakening almost, um, where the, the blackness is cleansed. There's a yellow known as citrinius, uh, citrine, 
which is kind of a bridge point between what you might call awakening and enlightenment, which is the red stage, the rubetto. But each stage has its own layers of burning and, and purification and challenge. And of course, you can take it level upon level upon level. But those in, in their original form, each of those four main colors are telling you something very specific about the stage they represent. Uh, so like you say, they're, they're very important. If you, if you needed to have something white in the plate, that white is is speaking directly to that stage and that piece of information. And if yeah, somebody comes along and colors it blue, the whole thing is now almost Messed I don't say destroyed, up. but it 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 it's changed the complete message that that was originally intended. Well, it's like giving someone a map and adding on ramps and off ramps. You know, um, it, it's going to misguide them um, to yeah. what degree? Who who knows? Um, but I'm with you. And everybody think back to the episodes on color. Jason and I have done. You know, he's talking about yellow. This, These are mind ideas and some of the things that we've laid down. But further, he laid down some numbers there. So let's quickly just go over uh, what's been called a, a cult edition, just so you have in mind that every darn thing in these images matters. How many of how many leaves are there? How many stars are there? Everything, every line, supposedly, from what I've read. So if you take the idea of a cult edition, Four will be the first number that you come to that sums to 10 because you add one, two, three, and four. And anything that sums to 10, which every three numbers later will do, uh, is the idea of perfection because 10 in these old systems is the idea of perfection. Um, so seven will do it um, if, you, if you follow. And there's also the idea of occult reduction where if I gave you a number like 28, you would add eight and two, right? So there's a couple things going on here and there's there's price I mean, I'm probably talking to you and I mean, I know I'm talking to you in diapers, but these are the basics that I've gleaned over years and years of reading the oldest stuff I can. And lastly, when you start on alchemical processes, one of the things I've read over and over and over and over from the most touted masters is no one's showing you where to start. You got to figure out where the road begins. And it's not just figuring out where the road begins. You on your own have to work out tons of stuff along the way. Now, when you come back to what these images are doing, it starts to make a little more sense. In other words, no one's going to hand you a well-described roadmap how to do this process. What you got was a symbolic image. Now go figure it out. How's that, Howdy? I would agree. So let's let's maybe take a look at plate one, and uh, I'm sure you'll leave in the description somewhere so people have the, the correct name or, or a place they can go online to take a look at it. Because again, like I'm saying, the images are like a painting. You need to look at them and really, really examine them. And even whatever I may have found in this from my years of study, I know I'm, I'm picking up like 30%, 40%. There's so many more layers here that are beyond what I can see in that Others out there listening to this right now might be the ones that pick up what we don't see, where this is kind of like an introduction, hopefully, to interest you to look at what might be here and that, that might be a value. So I'm maybe. with you. I, I feel like I'm scratching the surface. So are we? is this your text, by the way, that we're reading? Are we going to read the preface to the first plate here? Is that, are those your words? Yeah, this is all me. This comes from the appendix of okay. the book, the last thing. So yeah, if Jason wants to read on, go ahead. So, so there's a description for plate one. By the way, I found the reason why these plates look different, according to the notes in the Library of Congress version I'm looking at. It says the plates were re-engraved after the first edition published at La Rochelle in 1677. So that also tells you something about how they were put out. If we're talking about woodcuts, engraving lithographs, lithographs don't follow this rule. They're going to be black and white because they're going to print, right? So they've done an engraving that's going to print with basically black ink. The first plate in the Mutus Liber has a few words in Latin that translate as Mutus Liber, wherein all operations of hermetic philosophy are described and reported as set forth in hieroglyphic figures, sacred to God the Merciful, thrice great and greatest, and dedicated to the sons of the art, the name of the author being Altus. This is the only text that appears until plate 14. We are told it is hermetic, sacred to the thrice great, Thos Hermes, while the author is claimed to be Altus, high or one who has risen to the top of the pyramid. It is dedicated to all alchemists, philosophers, and seekers, the sons of the art. The first plate can help explain the first pyramid asleep state. The main focus of the plate is in the middle where a man is bound and sleeping up against a stone. 
This is obviously Jacob laying down on his way to Haran, placing his head on what is often called the Grail Stone. Jacob, like us, was asleep, not understanding his suffering, nor the nature of reality. He is bound by ropes and cannot move. These ropes are the wrappings of the mummy and symbolize the egoic mind that binds us to matter and thought. It can also represent Jacob as the chained man in Plato's cave. Interestingly, his left leg is raised up to make a triangular shape and represent that duality can only be transcended with a third force to make a pyramid triangle. Before him is a ladder that has two angels blowing trumpets, either as an attempt to wake Jacob or perhaps as a sound guide to lead him on his dream of heaven. Take notice that the two angels cut the ladder into three sections. Certainly no coincidence. Also note that the ladder gets smaller as it rises, suggesting as rows that the bottom rungs are much larger. Above are ten stars, ten starting a new cycle, along with a moon reflecting the light of the sun past the dark clouds that surround it, as if light is there for the sleeper. Just right now, it cannot be seen directly. Surrounding the middle image is a rose branch that is made to look like the Egyptian Ren glyph. The Ren surrounded a royal name, but also may represent a cave or bubble. The stems are tied and show two roses, which might represent this plate is showing that the sleeper, while with king-like potential, is currently stuck in cave-like shadow duality. All right. Damn, that was well written, Howdy. Um, just so Thanks. everyone's clear, this is Howdy's run at the first plate. What we'll do is, Howdy, you're going to, you can log in at Crow 777 Radio. Let's make sure yep. that between Jason, Howdy, and myself, that we pick a good version, maybe like Jason got. Problem is, I think Jason's from Archive. Let's make sure we've got good examples of the plates that have not been colored and stuff. But I'll let you open up, Howdy, but I will make the observation. And in my view, masonry, as we have it today, leverages off all these ideas, but it's lost so much. And it's almost like it fell further into duality. In other words, in masonry, there's the idea that people are profane if they're not masons. Well, who the hell are you? Are you God? Did you make people? Are you suited to make judgment on people in that way. From my point of view, you are not. And that is a big difference between what we're looking at here. But in so many of these plates, there will be a cloud cover with a hole where the light of the sun or the light of the moon, almost like we're living in the Alembic and there's an opening in the sealed hermetic flask that we live in and there's the light coming through. But go ahead, Howdy, take on plate one. Sure, and um, we can start on that first one where you, where we, yes, you talk about the the opening in the sky, and you'll see this in many of the plates. There are these little breaks, you might say, between levels or layers, where something from one layer is breaking through to another, and it reminds me very much of the um, uh, almost like the the idea of an, an outside force. That if you think of the the uh, circular branches as like Plato's cave or as like the bubble of perception that we're locked into, there are always these openings of something of a force outside try, potentially trying to get in, to me symbolized in the movies um, Pleasantville by David and Jennifer uh, as the outside force showing up in the town and beginning to show them a completely different different world and different reality. And, and uh, also in the Truman Show where it would be Sylvia who had sort of broke in and tried to, tried to shatter his reality. And I think that's, a, that's an important part of what's here that even though you may seem like Plato's cave is a locked thing. Uh, there is this, there is this force of intent. There is, you might say, in like in the in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, God is reaching out to Adam in the in the ceiling, but Adam must also reach out at the same time. You can't just have one reaching and not the other. And so I think all of those ideas are in play here, just with that one little showing of uh, a break in the bubble, you might say. So when, you know, I'm sitting here as you're speaking and I'm basically meditating on the image, we're on plate one here with, the, there's basically a big circle of, of a rose plant there, which I think, uh, how do you, uh, liken to a cartouche? I think most people recognize the name cartouche as the, you know, the, the binding area that goes around a supposed Egyptian King's name, but there is so much in this image. And every time I look at it, I come up with new ideas. And I think that's basically the point, but to get back. When we get into the second plate, it's going to be a real example. But look here how Jacob is on the earth. He's the below. Now, there's an angel blowing a trumpet. 
I agree with you, probably trying to awake him to let him know you're, you're sleeping, you're living in duality, you have no clue, but that angel is in the middle, almost like a go-between, between between the above and below, then all the way up at top, there's in the celestial or heavenly realm, another angel, and what is represented right above that angel is 10 stars, the idea of perfection. The moon, though, and I don't know, you know, I don't know enough, my first reaction to the moon is I want to relate it to mind and life and death, but like I said, I'm trying to get the safety pins off my diapers. Anything more you want to add to plate one? Yeah, again, to to me, this really, this really, you'll really see it if if you have the opportunity to see the plates. Someone can also then look at plate 15, which is the last plate, and you'll see the similarity. So you're seeing where the mutus libra is starting and where the mutus libra is going. And then the the middle part is like the sandwich of those two outside plates. And and, um, it's a path, right? It's well. It, it's a path, but the challenge becomes that uh, once you recognize that the path is about the transformative nature of death, and it's about the, it's about using that force to understand duality, uh, and understanding the the nature of of reality and the nature of the self. So it's these to me. These plates are presenting the most complete inner journey someone could potentially take which is to know the self or to know absolute reality and uh does so in an extremely wise way if you're willing to uncover the symbolism and then like you say not just take the symbolism mentally how can you put that back into yourself what are the exercises you can do to begin testing your perception your reality your everything and and i think that's all there in these plates if you're willing to if you're willing to really look that deeply within. I agree with what you're saying, and we should also point out another thing. So many people are going to go to Wikipedia to look this up. What Wikipedia is going to tell you is, we don't even know who wrote this. It's clearly a fraud. Now, that's the problem with modern thinking. The man's name is Altus to communicate to you that he is a master at the pinnacle of his art. It's also there so that you never know who the hell he was, because it is not about him. It is about what's being offered to every living human being in the world. It's like pre-Renaissance art that got replicated over and over and over by the Vatican, by Rome, by all these other places. The three fates quit being important what those three statues meant, and whoever carved it became the rock star, inverting the reason for the art in the first place. So I want to point that out. And lastly... As Howdy just described, that it starts with a man sleeping on a stone at the bottom of Jacob's ladder, and then there's an outcome at the very end. I view the Marseille deck of tarot probably leveraging off these older ideas, because I assume that the tarot that we see from France comes after these things. But in my view, the Golden Dawn took those symbolic images and they inverted it. First of all, they assigned a death card to 13, where there is no label death. And they called the fool zero. My view of those is you're looking at a similar schematic in symbology where the fool is the one taking the journey, starting at the magician in the tarot and going all the way up through the 22 major arcana and beyond um, to get to an outcome. And as Howdy just showed, uh, what we're talking about here is the difference between, in my view, and I don't know if you agree, is this first man's asleep. He doesn't understand anything important about the world, like all of us basically listening to this now, or most of us, probably. Um, And you can be more. You can be a higher human being. You can be an awakened human being, an enlightened human being. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And it's why Rose's ladder was so interesting to me. And I'll just share it really briefly with you and others in case they want to go look at it. It was two elements to to his uh, ladder idea. The first uh, of, of it was that he saw it as three pyramids, one on top of the other, with the need to go from the bottom of one to the top of that, uh, say, first pyramid, which then puts you at the bottom of the second pyramid, an entirely new process. Um, the first one being an, an emotional uh, work, the second being a mental work, and the third being like, a, like an observational work, you might say. So that was the first element, was these three completely different types of process you have to go through. But even more importantly, the thing that really got me about about what he was trying to say there was that if you decide, if you understand some of the metaphor and you get really honest with yourself, you can locate yourself on this ladder. You can figure out sort of metaphorically, well, what rung are you on? And what's important for that is 
is knowing who you can get help from and who you can help. Because if you try to go one rung, if you go one rung above you to somebody who's one level higher, they can teach you a lot of stuff. But if you try to go two or three or four levels higher than you, you won't be able to understand anything that's being said to you. Same thing with who can you help. If you try to reach too far down, if you try to reach three or four rungs down into the masses, you'll be seen as crazy. But if you go down one rung to someone who's just almost there but not quite, no matter where you are on the ladder, you will always have something to share with somebody just a bit lower than you as well. So it becomes like this symbiotic relationship of your journey. Well, while you're walking it alone, while you are the tarot fool alone, you can use this metaphor to know where, you're, where, where should your help come from and who should you help. So, Howdy, have you had a chance on plate one here uh, in the very lower left within the circle of roses? It almost looks like coded dates or, I don't know, something off a map. What are those numbers about? Have you taken that apart? Uh, I, I tried, and I just didn't come up with anything that I thought was of, of real value. And I thought if I said anything, it would probably be wrong. So it's why I didn't want to take a stab at it. For those who are listening, right, it's 21, 11, 82, and then 92, 82, 72, and then it looks like another 62, 82. It's hard to see the bottom ones, 31, 33. Followed uh, by yeah. neg, is that, do you take that to mean negative NEG or is that negrito or, and what's the bottom one? T, it's either T or F, U, E, D. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming, I would assume negretto would be the, the suggestion because this would be the first state. This would be the, the, the blackened state. And, and you get that sort of also from the sky. The sky in this plate is black. And Jacob's asleep. Jacob's unknowing. Jacob is also, if you notice, he's kind of, well, he, the image has some light to him. He's also, a lot of him is shadow and the rock he's on is shadow. So this is a very dark card, actually, a very dark plate. And uh, so I, I would take it to probably mean something to do with Negretto. The, the other one where, yeah, where it says, I would almost take it as a T, as a stylized T. So two ed uh, that's a hard one to, Almost to relate. Like a, so, but maybe yeah. this is something the listeners, somebody out there would, are going to be able to tap in and tell us what they think those are. The first line using occult reduction would come to be three, two, one. Interestingly enough, um, I've never taken the time, uh, but when I saw it, it looked like coordinates or coded date to me, but who knows there's, they're clearly there for a reason. All right. You guys want to move on to number two? Yep. Jason plate two. Oh, I guess we're going to do two through seven in the description. Plate two. The second plate of the Mutus Liber is divided into two, with two winged angels in the top half, and a man and a woman on the bottom. The bottom couple are kneeling as if praying towards a castle-like furnace to fuel the alchemic fire. Negredo is referred to as the cooking. The two sections are symbolizing duality. The castle can be thought of as the body of the two individuals, or perhaps they are the male and female halves of the same individual, where the prima materia is mixed with fire and then moistened with dew, blood, sweat, and tears that appears in plate four. This compost is then placed in the philosophic egg, which refers to awareness. This egg in the castle must be kept warm, but not hot, thus the need for the fire to be restrained from overheating or the work will be lost. This is a period for the alchemists when breath energy work, such as qigong, is important, not to feel healthier, but to generate the vast amount of energy that is required to look at our mind. Negredo is a head-on, ego-shattering experience and can bring about a fear of continuing. These reactions came from the old king or queen in us who wants to stay on the throne and rule. There is no way out, only in. That may be why the couple are praying. They know they are going to need guidance from something more than just their small self. Behind the couple are a series of drapes, like what one would see in a theater production, helping to indicate the movie-like quality to life. But if we look to the midpoint of the card, one of the angel's feet breaks the plane that divided the two scenes, a break in the bubble. We see the woman's hand reach up to touch the foot, similar to the Sistine Chapel ceiling where Adam and God touch fingers. The fact that the touch happens on the foot might symbolize that the work is in the very early stages. The angel's foot is like Sylvia in The Truman Show or David in Pleasantville, the outside force that comes to break the bubble of standard reality. Notice that the angels have a light and a dark leg, but it is the light leg 
that which dispels darkness that is what pierces the veil for those below. The couple will have to put in a great amount of energy to break this bubble, and the use of energy becomes a key focus in Negredo. How much time are we wasting watching TV or running for a tiny bit of pleasure or distraction? Should we know that we have so little time before death ends our fallacy of living an important life? Sean Nevins. So this is really quite an interesting image. I One of the first things I pick up on is the overwhelming uh, idea of gender, even in the angels. And again, to reiterate, uh, there is divisions in this scene. At the very bottom, we're earthbound. Almost feels to me like the angels are that intermediate trying to help get up to where the sun is being represented or the divinity is being represented. But there's an interesting thing about the the plate number is two. It almost looks like it's a Ju- Jupiter symbol with the upright gone. Did you notice that, Howdy? Yes, I did, actually. For the major points that I would point out, because I'm not going to try to expound meaning, it's like, you know, I feel like I'm standing on the bottom rung, so why would I? But what I notice from the symbology that I understand is, again, we have this opening uh, through the clouds or the firmament where the sun is, like almost beyond, like the light of this world is being sourced from beyond, or that's a portal to the idea of heaven. But what I see predominantly here is the idea of gender. And as you noted, the right foot of both the angels, one male, one female, is white. The left foot, or the sinister side, which is left in the old Latin, is dark or black. And then uh, we can go on and on, but it almost looks like there's a a Neptunian idea going on in the bu- in the water bubble they're holding and clearly the man has a sun symbol and the woman has a moon symbol again this is about gender but also notice the uh neptunian figure with the trident in his hand he's got a certain angle to his knee which i know is important but go ahead howdy yeah something i found really interesting uh, for right away about the plates is how sort of now after the first plate all of the remaining sort of 2 to 14, they intermingle often in some way. So like Neptune is here in plate 2, and he'll be there again in plate 3. Uh, the the bottom, which has the castle and the drapes, has blank walls in this case. But later on, you'll see images where the castle will be there, and now there'll be windows in the wall. And so it, it, it's like they're, they're, the plates are also not individual somehow, that they there's a a growth or a change or a transformation in the images that you find that will appear in later plates. So that's the first thing to to kind of get, that if they're, they, they somehow flow together, even if on the surface they don't feel like the flow. But to me, the, the thing that drew me so interestingly, because I, like you, I really like this plate, and it's, it's starting at that bottom part where you've got the drapes being pulled apart as if like that you're, you're seeing – you're seeing the wizard, trying to see the Wizard of Oz, right? Na- the reality is being shown to be uh, false here. Reality is shown a, to be a stage. <laughs> a stage, yeah. And and um, I think that's an, a really important part of the message of this card that you're not even ready almost to begin the process of of this work, or it's at least telling you that the initial work in the castle is about seeing the truth of reality. That's that's stage one. That to really to really question to really question the nature of of your reality. So there's another thing about this. If you take the vertical division, um, you already know, you've already seen the horizontals. So that drop of water resides down. I don't know if that's an old style Olympic, um, but the drop of water is there. By the time it gets up to the mid area where the male and female angels are helping, the water now contains the gender ideas and the Neptunian ideas. And look at the two angels. Look at the difference between the men and the woman at the bottom, their clothes, their dress, everything. Look how much more similar they are by the time you get up to the angels. And then look within the droplet. You can see that it's very clearly delineated, that it almost looks like Neptune's got his hand around each gender. Of course, the Triton is with the male side and the sun, positive polarity. It's almost like he's reaching out to pull them together. Yeah, and that's uh, I know that's an important part of the, the marriage, discussion at right. this point, which is the which is the, the the understanding of the sexual energy within the body and the understanding of not wasting that energy, but finding ways to harness and control it and use it in 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 really proper ways and understanding the the gender that's existent in the world, 
so that you also know how to interact correctly with the world. I don't know if I mentioned this in one of the other talks, but like, for example, back in the in the Mayan world or the ancient world, they understood that certain elements of the world were would be masculine, certain elements of the world would be feminine, and we had to we had to take that role on ourselves. We had to become feminine to perform a feminine task properly. We had to become masculine to perform a masculine task properly. And this was, of course, learning how to access these two uh, halves, you might say, within to fuse, start fusing them into one workable whole, which I think is what, yeah, it's like you, the the eventually reaching the the sun at the top, which is sort of this this internal transformed and fused qualities of gender that are related in this card. You know, if you look in the black and white version, not in the colored version, it looks like Neptune or Hermes, whoever this character is supposed to be, is sitting above a creature of some sort. His right foot, it looks like there's something with an eye at the bottom. It's kind of hard to make out, but there's something there that's not visible in the color plate. I'll just take a quick look at some other images to try to get it a bit uh, tighter. That would make sense if, if for, for anyone who's seen a lot of pictures, for example, of, of like St. George, right? And his, his uh, oh yes, I see. Now that I have a little better, different type of image. And you see this a lot in, in ancient Egypt or in early Christian art or in the, uh, the box of Nantes, the, the alchemic box of Nantes that I did the discussion on, which is also a fascinating, oh man, we could talk for hours about that that sarcophagus box in, in Nantes, France, where there's the image of the person standing on the serpent, uh, usually standing on the serpent's head. And often the serpent's head is upside down. I, I, it's hard to know for sure if it is in this image, which is, again, symbolizing the control of the egoic mind or symbolizing the control of, of the thinking process that by standing or, or having that, that uh, symbolic image, again, bringing it into the subconscious where we are able to use that image to control our own wandering mind. So here's an interesting thing. There are 15 plates that we're going to do here. And I went back and found a guy named Samuel Norton, who's from the 16th century. So we're in the ballpark, although he's English. And he sets forth the steps of an alchemical process like this. One, purgation. Two, sublimation. Three, calcination. Four, exuberation. Five, fixation, six, solution, seven, separation, eight, conjunction, nine, putrefaction in sulfur, 10, solution of bodily in sulfur, 11, solution of sulfur of white light, 12, fermentation and elixir, 13, multiplication in virtue, and finally, 14, multiplication and quantity. And of course, just to put that into context, if you want just what they put in places like Wikipedia, you'll find calcination, solution or dissolution, separation, conjunction, putrefaction, congelation, cybation, sublimation, fermentation, exaltation, multiplication, and projection. There's variations on this, but sometimes, like what I just read, tries to make it in words that we're closer to. But let me put it this way. The one I read from Wikipedia seems off a bit. I don't know where you stand on that. Yeah, and, and partially this is all about, they're writing this at a time where if you, if you talk about these things openly, you get killed. So we have to be quite clear that if you're dealing with alchemic or hermetic work at this period of time, and you don't know how to keep your mouth shut or put things in a way that no one can figure out what you're talking about, you don't last very long. So all of that is is designed in this that there's there's one half of it where the, the idea is you don't want to just tell someone directly you need them to give them just assistance like you say to go within and figure it out themselves and at the same time how do you present this stuff in such a way that no one's going to kill you for presenting it so even the words that are used are I also think are kind of sort of <laughs> a pointer but only a pointer. If you take them too directly or too completely, I think then you already get lost in a mental concept rather than reminding that it's just a finger pointing at the moon. They want you to, they want you to look at the moon, not the finger. So in one way, this would relate to kind of the biblical scripture about casting your pearls before swine. I've read accounts where it's this way because it's powerful and you must be prepared and be a decent human being before you get to these things. That's why there's just not a roadmap for anyone to pick up because people at lower rungs of the ladder would misuse it. As an example, the old allegory 
of uh, the alchemist turning base metal into gold. Well, that's a lost leader, right? Because a real alchemist doesn't give a damn about gold per se as a valuable commodity to serve as some kind of money, right? What does matter to the alchemist is the idea that any base metal can be transmuted. And so even the story that everyone's familiar with, it has a lost leader in it, kind of. Yeah, and, and it's also challenging because everyone's path will be different. You know, there, right. if there's 10,000 people listening to this, everyone's path would be somewhat different based on their own experiences, their own egoic structures, their own traumas, their own everything. So anyone who tries to lay down, this is the path that you have to use, or this is the, the methods you have to use to, to know your true self. Well, they're already lying to you because even though that's what may have worked for one person, there's no guarantee that that's what someone else needs. It can only just be a a few pointers and a few ideas that, okay, this is how some, someone else did it, but you've got to find your own way. You've got to find your own your own method that works right for you. And, and so it's also interesting to have it as artwork, you might say, because it does force you to have to figure it out yourself as opposed to just reading words in a book and saying, oh, well, Joe says to do this, so that's what I'm going to do. It, a lot of this is really figuring a lot of it out for yourself. And, and I think that's also part of what kind of layering in the alchemic image of the alchemist who who is shown in the in the laboratory and working with the element is that they just have some ideas and they are actually attempting almost experiments to kind of figure things out for themselves right they're testing like you say they're testing the elements so that they know how to test themselves so there's another important idea about what you laid down there and it's one of the things that's drawn me into these older ideas is the difference between philosophy and science right? So what you said, uh, I agree with. In philosophy, there's a method here, but it's a method that could be used a million ways and then maybe a million more. It depends on the circumstance of the individual, but the philosophy is so malleable that each individual, no matter where they reside or you know what they've dealt with or what they need to deal with, can be shaped into a way to get them where they're going. Whereas in science, things are very rigid, right? If you're going to do this right. experiment, you do it this way, this is the acceptable outcome. And my problem with that has always been it forces you to do things like these two ideas are in opposition, so one is right and one is wrong. What I truly appreciate about these philosophies is they will say, yes, they're opposing ideas, but both are correct or both are acceptable is maybe a better way to use it. Now, you may never use these opposing ideas in the same situation or on the same day, but certainly when the situation merits it, you may be using one or the other, and that's the best I can illustrate it. Yeah, and I would also sort of look at it uh, too is that uh, when this comparison brought up this idea that if you're looking for truth, if someone really wants to know truth, like capital T truth, if someone already thinks they know what that is and know what the end result is, you're already lost. Because then you're only just, you're focusing anything you do on a desired result, as opposed to this understanding of, oh, I don't know what the truth is. I don't really know what the end point is. And I'm willing to do the work to find out whatever that may be. Even if it's even if something I, I, I wish I didn't know, I still want to know it because that's what I want. And so this idea, like you say, of, uh, of a scientific method almost all, all generally has, a, an, like you say, an accepted result. The, the, the experiment is correct if you get one of these answers, as opposed to if you're searching for truth, you'll know what the truth is when you finally have realized it, and it may not be what you wished it would be. Right. Well, just to put a fine point on it, in science, if you count to 10, then you go to 11. But in these philosophical meanings, they would point out that 10 can also be one and a new beginning, and that 11 could be two. And then they'll go on to say things like two and five are the evilest of numbers when they're pulled from the decan. But numbers used within the decan, there is no evil number. There's no such thing. And that comes down to human intention. In other words, uh, numbers are numbers until some human being gets their hands on them and does whatever it is they do. With them. That's the way I take this to mean. In other words, a person with no ill will in their body would never facilitate two or five being evil ideas. And that pulls back to Crowley's idea of 11 being the evilest of number. And of course, 11 is two. Plate three is still broken into an upper and lower section. The middle area is made of three circles, one inside of the other. 
mirroring Rose's pyramid inside a pyramid. This continuous circular movement can also give the indication of a labyrinth or a spiraling funnel. Neptune, who rules water in dreams, rides on the top. Within the center circle are two fishermen, one fishing while the other is laying back, perhaps showing that one part of us wants to do work, fishing is often a metaphor for meditation, while another part wants to be lazy. The middle area has a ram and a bull, symbols of sexual energy that need to come under control at the beginning stage on a landscape, while below them is a woman with a basket and a man throwing a fishing rod. The rod pierces the circle and goes into the third. The outer circle has a flock of ten birds, perhaps indicating the ten stars from the first card are getting closer to us. So I would point out that almost everything I've read says that true alchemy is locked to the sky clock. All serious alchemical procedures begin in the spring. On the left side, uh, second ring, we have the ram. It's Aries. So we could assume that on the other side uh, is Taurus the bull. And so we can start to use the sky clock because these are probably alchemical procedures as much as anything else. So I think that's part of what we're looking at, and it's definitely nautical. What I noticed is it looks like old, uh, if that is Neptune up top, he's riding a phoenix, a dark phoenix. Mm. But of course, gender is absolutely here again, as are the heaven and earth ideas, because on the left side is the sun, male, positive, masculine, and on the other side, the moon, and the faces on them match what I just said, sun being masculine, the moon being feminine. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, I could stare at this for so long. And by the way, I'm noticing that's a turkey in the dead center outer ring uh, that looks to be a turkey with the man pointing down to the migrating birds or whatever they are. And then there's the fishnet. There is so much here. I could go and go and go. Yeah. It, and, and I also found a lot of sim- similarity in this particular. Car- and, and what's interesting is when you when we do when we look at plate four, it'll almost look like we've zoomed in. It's like you got a zoomed in image of the middle of this when you go to the next plate because it, it's like almost the same with a few additions. But the top part there has a hill just above the, the, the fisherman in the boat. And and the hill quickly reminded me of the uh, flurry tableau that you find on the uh, on the wall at the church at Renle Chateau. Mm. That very, a very strange uh, set of this giant mural that has, that actually, even though there's Jesus on the mount, talking to disciples or, or followers in the middle, it's, it's the things on the sides of them that are normally wouldn't be ignored. That's where the important information is. And it's got, uh, and it has this, this, this image has a lot of the sim- similar things here. There's uh, there's some more things that I'm picking up on here down in the outer ring. There's a fishing net um, or what appears to be a fishing net, at least half of it. That is the same pattern put in the clouds up above. Uh, also, you will notice that the left eye, which often represents looking back in the sun, is disproportionate to the right eye. Now look over at the moon. The left eye is cut off almost out of frame, and half, well, part of the moon's right eye is darked out. Um, So many things as you get into this. Quite an interesting plate. Isn't it? And, uh, And of course, the net... One of the well, I didn't I forgot to put it when I was writing this was I wrote this about eight or nine years ago, but uh, the net is very is similar to uh, the idea of Tehute Toth, who talks about the net of reality. That uh, what's blinding us it's another it's another uh, similar idea to the veil of Isis, and that it's it's this right. net that keeps us trapped into into uh, the duality. And of course, it's no surprise that the internet has the nickname of the net in our modern world. Well, in the lowest, you know, down in the outer lowest ring, um, you will notice that the net is doubled like it is up in the clouds uh, where the water is darked out. And above it, where I I guess this is the separation of air and water, because those are birds migrating down, the net is not as dense uh, on the bird side of things. And if you go up into the clouds, you get similar similar cross-hatching. It's very clear that someone intentionally cross-hatched in the way they did. There's just a lot here. Even look how the uh, the guy sitting next to the turkey, the lines in the back of the drawing. It's almost like he's glowing. So much here. Yeah, it is. And like you say, it's it's so it's so carefully done that, uh, yep. like you be did at the beginning, you have to treat this like every single pen stroke was done with a very clear message that nothing is in this by accident. 
You know, what's interesting about this in the black and white word doc where the image is not so good. It really shows you the difference between the dark and the light areas like the God all the way up at top is glowing. The clouds around him are very dark. But at the bottom, it's almost like you could take this middle part to it, it reminds me of the Tibetan wheel of life a lot. Mm. Like those rings are the world we live in. So once you get out, look what's outside the sun and moon below. There's like clouds or firmament above. There's dark net like clouds. So much going on here, but it's so reminiscent of the wheel of life from Buddhism. Does the creature on the bottom of the middle circle have two heads? Yes. So that, that would obviously be, be a, you know, another depiction of duality. And I wonder Actually, as I'm looking at the man. They, they. I, I heard he was sleeping, but it's it's almost like he's kind of in a in a chair or a box or even a leaning um, and basket. holding a trident. He's holding the inverted crown as a trident. But look, yeah. he's like fishing down while he's holding on to the you know connected to the boat fishing above. In the center ring, it's clearly things we don't recognize. In the center, no. in the second ring, it's things we do recognize. And in the outer ring, it's maybe aspects of the two i would say yeah i would have to assume your your uh viewpoint now is pretty much correct that probably the middle circle would be the inner world like the like like the the meta the the, the work on the mind and then the the middle circle that's external working like something with the senses then like you say this third ring is something is a third complete level of of work almost almost feels like the like i said like the tibetan wheel of life you would read it radially and well people from familiar with the tibetan wheel of life you should go look at it that's an important thing to understand if for no other reason because the center circle has the three poisons in it but there's a similar thing right it's almost like the outer ring the third outer ring here is the movement right like, look, the guy's pointing, so the birds are going down, and then there's the water. It's almost like a, a life cycle. But how do you? We're we're about to the top of the first hour, so I'm going to wrap up here. You want to quickly give people information about how they can contact you or where they can find you online? Sure, you can uh, start for now while it's still existing to Howdy McCoskey Talks on uh, YouTube. I'm actually at the point now of I'm reading this entire book chapter by chapter every week. So you can even, even though you don't have the book, you can follow along. And my website, which has the very strange name of Egyptian-Wisdom-Revealed.com, will also have updates and information on all the books I've written and uh, how to get in contact with me. You know, this I, I was a little leery to do Mutus Lieber, partially because I feel like I'm on the lowest lungs, rungs of the ladder. I don't feel like it. I know it, actually, to be more honest about it. But these types of things, like the tarot that I've been studying, it's almost like anyone who comes to look at the symbols will gain what they gain, and it may be completely different than the other three, four, five hundred people that looked at it. There may be similarities. There may be people who have studied alchemy, so there are key points where they agree. But it's just in doing this first hour, I got to get back into the Mutus Libra. I've been doing the Marseille deck, which is playing on the same ideas. But that is the first hour of episode 291. The first hour will be running for free at crow777radio.com. Second hour, members know to log in. So I'd like to wish you all a happy, healthy, and higher-minded new era. And we're going to get through, if we can, the rest of the plates of the Mutus Lieber. And these are fascinating things. And by the way, for you people interested in the Bible, you could literally be matching scripture in certain parts here. Um, the alchemist did that, actually, I'm aware of. So there it is, man. Cheers.
is the enemy of knowing.